Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and as you can see, I've got most of my game room out of boxes and back together again, so uh, there's a few couple big pieces that still need to be done, but pretty soon things should be returning to normal. But for now, welcome to part four of our review slash how-to for Cult Divinity Lost, or at least how I play Cult Divinity Lost. There's a few different ways things can be interpreted. But today, we're going to be discussing WHY WON'T YOU DIE! combat. And as with other Powered by the Apocalypse games, combat in Cult is pretty different than it is in other tabletop role-playing games that I've played before, and the most difficult part for us was having to unlearn how we've played combat in all the other games that we've played. Uh, this is made even more difficult because Cult doesn't have a, a nice and neat combat section like other games, but instead splits them up between uh, the section covering player moves and uh, conflict rules, and then uh, game master section that's covering the different conflict rules, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to navigate. So, building on what we covered in the last video covering game mechanics, let's go ahead and dive into conflicts. For gamers that are experienced with other systems, the first thing you need to do is put out of your mind any notion of things like combat rounds, initiative, movement speed. Those are things that do not exist in cult because it's far more narrative than simulation focused. And like with other actions, in the game, conflicts are handled through player moves and game master moves. The four most common player moves for this are going to be engage in combat, avoid harm, endure injury, and act under pressure. And how those uh, moves get used depends on how the narrative begins. If the game master begins the conflict with uh, their own moves, such as the monster leaps from the open manhole, its teeth glistening like broken glass and its claws swiping toward you, what do you do? The player might respond with their own moves, such as rolling out of the way and trying to escape, which that would be an avoid harm, or they might pull out their gun and start shooting at it, hoping to stop this monster before it can hit them, which that would be an engage in combat. Or the player might try to describe an action that's a combination of those two. I roll out of the way of its claws as it comes passing by me, but then I come up in a crouch and I shoot it in the side of the head. With that, the Game Master simply calls for the one player move that best encompasses what all it is that the player is wanting to do. So in the case of that skit, you know, I would call for a violence roll rather than calling for an avoid harm. But in some cases, the player is going to be calling for a lot of steps. You know, like, I'd like to push this NPC friend out of the way, and then I want to roll to the side to avoid the attack, and then I want to uh, toss this amulet into the open manhole that the creature came out of, and then uh, coming up from my roll, I'm going to crouch, I'm going to start firing at the monster. So Game Masters, you might need to split that up into two separate moves, or simply choose the single move that is the most appropriate for all of those actions, and then give that a, a minus one or a minus two modifier, just depending on you know, how complicated it was. For example, we had a combat where a character had dropped her pistol as two gunmen were coming after her. So she hid behind a wall and said that when the first gunman came into view, or at least uh, when their pistol came into view, because I was out before them, uh, she wanted to grab that pistol and yank it to the side, kick that guy out of the way, dive in between the two gunmen, snatch her own gun up off the ground, and then roll underneath a car, all as one fluid move, like something out of a John Wick movie. Now, that is several steps involved there, and while pushing one of her attackers away, that certainly falls under the engage in combat move, she wasn't attempting to really to cause injury as much as get him out of the way so she could get to her own weapon. So I ruled that that was just going to be an act under pressure, but with a minus one because that was a pretty combina you know, complicated combination of moves. And, you know, I would have let the player uh, argue or negotiate that she should use engage in combat for that uh, if that's what she would prefer to use, just depending on what her skills are. But either way, I was going to be condensing it into a single role. Or the player might be the one that's instigating the conflict, such as Murphy spits out his toothpick and growls, I told you to keep your nose out of my business and he kind of opens his jacket and begins reaching for a holstered pistol. I spring forward and get my knife to his neck before he's got a chance to draw. In which case, that example would be an engage in combat move. Both examples show a clear consequence for failure if the player fails the roll. Uh, one of them would be the monster hits you with its claws, and the other being that the bad guy draws their gun and shoots you. So the player rolls their 2d10 as the appropriate attribute modifier and any other modifiers the game master gives, and we just total up those results. With a total success of 15 or more, the player performs the action exactly how they wanted it to go, avoiding any attacks, and then we'll get to damage and harms later on. 
On a partial success of a 10 to 14, we have a success, but at a cost. For those, we have several options that are uh, given here, such as a counterattack, meaning that the monster hits you as well, or you don't do the full damage against the monster bad guy, you know, meaning that we might reduce harm by minus one or minus two, or you spend more ammo than you intended. It says here that you expend all your ammo, but I prefer to say that it's more than intended, like, you know, double the ammo cost. I know where a new problem appears, or some future problem might come up. On a 9 or lower, the player character fails to do what it was they intended, meaning the consequences are even worse. So now they're in a worse spot than they were before, before they did the attack. Maybe they missed their opponent entirely, or they spent all of their ammo, or maybe they got out of the way of the monster, but the person beside them, their friendly NPC, was killed by the attack. Uh, the cost should be much higher than it is for a partial success, but in a way that makes sense and is still thrilling for the story. Now, if the bad guy gets an attack because of a poor player role, the Game Master has two different ways that they can handle that. Uh, they can allow the player to roll and avoid harm, to dodge out of the way and not get hit by this attack, which that would make it a soft move. Or the Game Master can declare that the player was successfully struck by the bad guy and the player needs to go ahead and roll their Endure Injury, which that makes it a hard move. Now, in the case that the player gets a partial success on their attack roll, you know, leaves themselves open to a counterattack, I'm much more inclined to allow the player to make an avoid harm roll, meaning that they can still avoid that attack that's going to be made against them. Uh, but if they have a total failure, meaning that they got the nine or less on that violence roll, I'm more inclined to make that counterattack an automatic hit, a hard move. Uh, that way the player just has to go ahead and roll to see you know, how well they endured that injury. For avoid harm, a total success means that you dodge any harm at all. On a partial success, you might receive partial damage or lose something like your weapon or something that you're carrying, or you could get out of the way, but you know, once you come up out of it, you're now in a bad spot, leaving yourself open to more threats or added a disadvantage to your next action because you're now prone on the ground or something. On a total failure, it is worse, meaning that you took full harm from your opponent or you're a seriously worse spot than you were before. Personally, I just see this as being twice as bad as a success with complications is. So, Game Masters could have it where they got a partial harm and they lost something that was important to them. Or maybe they dropped whatever they were holding and they got knocked prone on their butt. So Game Masters, if you're thinking of ideas of what this could mean, just look up a success with complication and use two of those and, you know, subtract out the part where they also succeeded. Now let's talk about damage, which is called harms in Cult Divinity Lost. There are two ways that harms work. For player characters, harms are damage potential. For NPCs, they're more like conventional hit points that you'd have in another tabletop role-playing game. Weapons and attacks have a harm rating, such as unarmed attacks here, uh, punching, kicking, those do one harm, while edged weapons like knives and daggers, those inflict two harm. If a player character is hit, they roll their endure injury, which is uh, with the number of harms that they took as a negative modifier to that. So if Jack, who has a fortitude rating of plus two, were hit for two harm, he would roll 2d10 plus two for his fortitude, and then minus two for the two harms that he took, making this just a straight 2d10 roll for the injury. On a total success, the injury is superficial, maybe light cuts and bruises, some torn clothing, you know, bloody nose, anything like that. Uh, they still got hit by the attack, but the damage that they received isn't enough damage to, to really matter. On a success with complications, you might be thrown off balance, meaning that they're shaken or dazed, incurring minuses to their next action roll, or require an act under pressure to perform actions they might have otherwise been able to perform with no issue at all. Or they might lose something on their person or something that they're holding. Or they might suffer a serious wound, which that's going to incur minuses to all actions until that's tended to. These could be deep lacerations, broken ribs, concussion, broken fingers, or sprains. These are considered to be non-life-threatening injuries, or at least not immediately life-threatening injuries, but they are going to require first aid to heal. The player notes on their sheet what the wound is. Having an unstabilized serious wound incurs a minus one on all rolls, and the character can have up to four serious wounds at a time. While having multiple serious wounds, each of those needs to be stabilized separately, but you only receive the minus one once, so if you have three untreated wounds or a single untreated serious wound, that's still just going to be a minus one to all your rolls. Any serious wounds after the fourth are immediately upgraded to being a critical wound, which that is a whole lot worse. 
on an endure injury roll that is a total failure. The injury is considered overwhelming. In this case, the player chooses what the result is. Once again, the player is the one that chooses this. They could be knocked out, meaning that they're stunned with pain or they're just knocked unconscious, and they're going to come out of it whenever the game master deems appropriate for that. Uh, maybe that's going to be later on in the same conflict that they're going to wake up or come out of it, or they might just wake up in the next scene being captured and in some cell somewhere and have to get out. So the game master also can inflict a serious wound as well if they see fit. Now one thing with getting knocked out is that the player is trusting that the game master ain't going to come along and murder the character while they're just lying there unable to defend themselves, right? You know, if a game master does that, you can be guaranteed that that player is never going to choose that option again because, you know, this ain't supposed to be a death sentence here. The player is merely agreeing that they are not going to be able to move their character or act in any way until another character comes along and either stabilizes their wounds or the game master is decided that enough time has passed and now the player character can act. There is a bit of trust involved here. Or the player can elect to take a critical wound. Now these things are bad news. And unlike serious wounds where you can have four at a time, you can only have one critical wound at a time. These include punctured lung, intestinal evisceration, gouged eye, spinal damage, and cerebral hemorrhage. These are life-threatening wounds that require immediate medical care. And even once they're healed, they may have lingering effects, like you're walking with a cane or simply missing a hand that got chopped off or you're missing an eye now. Having a critical wound poses a minus one to all character roles, and this is in addition to any penalties that they have for having any non-stabilized serious wounds that they have as well. So if a player character receives a critical wound, they are in mortal peril. If they get stabilized, the threat of imminent death is gone, but they're still going to suffer a minus one to all their roles. Essentially, if your character is eviscerated, right, and you're lying there in a pool of blood with your intestines pulled around you, and another character comes up and they poke all your guts back inside you and Wrap all that up with a bunch of duct tape, congratulations. Your character has now been stabilized and is going to live long enough to complete the adventure and get your ass to a hospital, that way you don't die on nobody. However, you're still going to be suffering a minus one in all your actions going forward because you got a roll of duct tape that's holding all your guts inside you. You know, there ain't nothing like no magic potions, a cleric laying of hands, no eight hour rest to make all your boo-boos go away. Nah, in cult, if you are injured, you are seriously fucked up. The final choice is death. Maybe they have no injury slots available to them anymore and they can't take another critical wound. Maybe the player feels that it's dramatically appropriate at this time. The game master might give them a chance to say some last words or make some final defiant act, but that's about it. If the group has some advanced medical equipment on them, maybe they can resuscitate the character, but otherwise the character is dead. Better luck next life. Now personally for our group, we have house ruled a fourth option here. And if a player rolls a total failure on an endure injury roll, uh, they could receive two serious wounds. So that's going to be two separate wounds, and they're going to require stabilization for each of those separately, but I do give that as an option. The big thing here is that that is going to be two separate injuries. Like let's say a character, they got thrown through a wall and that broke their arm, but they also ended up with a big ass splinter of wood that's now impaled right through their leg. You know, neither of those are critical injuries, but both of them are going to require separate medical aid in order to treat them. NPC damage is handled a little bit differently. Harms for them are more like hit points, so you can see that a regular civilian has three harm, while a hardened gang member has four. Meanwhile, a monster like a Karyath can take up to 13 harm. When a character inflicts damage with an attack, you simply use the damage that the weapon does, uh, such as a crushing weapon like a baseball bat inflicts two harm, or a mow down burst from assault rifle inflicts four harm, or simply subtract what that number is from the number of harms that the bad guy can take, and that's it. Now, NPCs also come with several suggested reactions to being hit, and these are tailored for whatever type of NPC it is. So a civilian might beg for their life or get knocked out after taking their first injury, while a Karyoth might have descriptions of the injury or have things that give the players an edge, such as a plus one to all their rolls against it, or maybe bad things such as an automatic bonus counterattack, uh, attempting and you know, eliciting an avoid harm from them, or different things that require a keep-it-together roll 
game masters can use any of these that they like or just make up their own effects from the damage, but I like how each of the creature has a good list of possible things that the game master can have as responses, uh, some of those simply being color, while some of them have their own effects to keep it exciting and cinematic and, you know, much more exciting than just simply noting that it took three damage and then moving on to the next player in line. You know, it makes that each action that's made against these creatures elicits a different type of effect. Healing a cult is slow. It's a lot like real life here, and more than once we've had adventures in with the player characters heading off to the hospital, followed by a few weeks of recovery. Now, during the session, there are a few things that can be done to lessen the effect of damage. For serious wounds, the effect can be negated by painkillers or alcohol for the duration of that single scene. The wound is still there, but the minus one to rolls is negated, at least for a little while. Stabilization is a better method. For that, the characters are usually going to need to have a first aid kit or a trauma bag. Now, personally, I feel that a first aid kit should have a finite number of uses before it's considered spent. Like a, a small personal kit might have two uses, while a professional trauma bag might have five or six uses. Performing first aid on another character, if there is no immediate threat, you know, some monster coming at him or some distracting uh, surroundings going on, there is no roll required. The wound is automatically stabilized. If there is an imminent threat or the situation calls for it, the character must roll and act under pressure in order to get this uh, wound bound or stop the bleeding in time while some sort of threat is coming for them. And if they don't have a first aid kit in order to do this roll, it's done at a minus two penalty. Now, I also say that that if they don't have a first aid kit on them and they're still trying to do the wound but there's no immediate threat, because they don't have the first aid kit, I still go ahead and have them roll and act under pressure uh, just to reflect that. But if they have a kit and there is no immediate threat, then no roll made at all. Critical wounds, however, always require an act under pressure roll because of the severity of the wound. This is, you know, arterial bleeding here. And even then, once it's stabilized, it still inflicts a minus one to all rolls by the injured character. Now, after some time has passed, you know, a few days or a few weeks, the critical wound can downgrade to a stabilized serious wound before eventually it heals and goes away. But how long that takes, that's completely up to the game master and the nature of the wound itself. Armor is also a consideration. For player characters, there's light and heavy armor, giving them either a plus one or a plus two protection. The bonus is applied to their endure injury roll. Monsters and bad guys might have uh, their own armor or natural armor that's made from you know thickened hides or metal skin. And for NPCs, armor value is subtracted from damage. So if you do three harm against a bad guy and it's got one point of armor, then only two points of harm get through. Which is kind of weird when you think about it, because you could have a player character that's got one point of armor and a bad guy does one point of damage against them. However, the player character, they still got a roll on their door injury and it ends up that they got a critical wound and now they got a punctured lung and now they're on death's door. Meanwhile, you could have an NPC that's got one point of armor, you do one harm against them and that cancels itself out and now the NPC's walking around like nothing happened. Kind of seems like a double standard to me. One house rule that I suggest to help counteract this is to employ success levels of the attack that's being made. So if a player attack is a total success, maybe we reduce the armor a little bit, maybe a little, little bit more of that damage get through. Or if the result, uh, once you do modifiers and everything, was a 20 or higher, uh, maybe the damage from that attack you know, had some sort of other effect, you know, such as you know, it reduced the armor, it does more damage, you know, representing just how good of an attack that was. Now, weapons have a few special rules. First, many have several options that players can choose from, such as unarmed, they can attack for one harm, or they can lock their opponent in a hold for zero harm, or throw or shove their enemy back, perform a disarm, or just go all in with excessive force, increasing the damage but disregarding their own safety and leaving themselves open to counterattacks. Most weapon categories offer several options for attack. I recommend picking up one of the weapon decks that are out there or make a cheat sheet to give to your players that they can easily see and reference all the various options they have uh, when they pick up a weapon. And that way they don't just fall into the habit of, of just doing the simple attack with it for X amount of damage. They can see all the different things that they can do. Now weapon range, that is pretty simple. Instead of it being listed as a set of numbers of you know, feet or meters or anything like that, it uses range categories. Uh, arm is close enough to touch with something. And then there's room, field, and horizon. And I really like this method of abstraction much more than how zones are done in other games out there because it's still vague, it's still very open to interpretation, but it's a distance that you can easily visualize than just saying,
saying it's two zones away, you can say, well, they're about a field away from you, but not quite horizon. Ranged weapons use ammo, and every weapon type has its own ammo value. Ammo represents the number of attacks that a weapon can make before it needs reloading, but it doesn't represent how many individual bullets that the weapon holds. For example, and just looking at pistols here, a pocket pistol holds two ammo. A standard handgun holds four, while a magnum handgun holds three. Different attacks use different amounts of ammo, such as with a handgun, combat shooting uses one. Overkill increases the damage, but that costs two ammo, or shooting multiple targets uses three ammo. Now, while I understand the game is not trying to be a simulationist and get really lost into all the minutia and details, I do find the ammo values a bit annoying. A uh, 38 revolver, that holds six bullets, but that's four ammo in cult. While a Sig P226 holds that's 15 rounds of 9mm, but that's also four ammo in cult. So I feel that it should be up to six ammo, depending on what type of handgun it is. I you know, kind of give a little bit of wiggle room, uh, saying that you know a handgun holds somewhere between four or six, just depending on what type of handgun it is. Assault rifles, those hold four ammo, while SMGs, they only hold three, which, you know, SMGs normally carry, you know, 20 to 30 round magazines. Some of them can carry up to a 50, which, yes, burst fire can chew through rounds, but a single shot semi-auto, that should still be an option. So I feel that the ammo values, those should be higher. You know, maybe six for an assault rifle and five or six for an SMG. SMGs really got the short end of the stick here, because despite that huge magazine, these things only hold three ammo. And outside of a single option where I could just dump this entire mag and hit up to three bad guys at the same time, these really don't have any advantage over a basic pistol, which these things hold four ammo. Also, while there are rules for shooting multiple targets by emptying your magazine, kind of sweeping the, the gun between them, I'd have liked an option for doing a full mag dump on a single opponent. You know, some monster comes out and the player character decides to focus all their fire on it and just unload their entire gun. I think there should be an option for, uh, for you know, they're going to use all their ammo for it, but maybe that opponent's going to get one or two additional harm because all that auto fire is only going against them and this is a full mag dump. Now, when I that I'm considering employing for our game, I, I, haven't, I haven't put this one in yet, is either for a total success, or maybe if we do a 20 or higher, reduce the ammo cost on a firearm by one. So if an attack normally costs one ammo, providing it isn't a single shot weapon, then it costs no ammo if they roll high enough. Or a burst attack that normally costs two ammo on a good enough roll that's only going to cost them one ammo. And this is kind of representing the player character's skill and training to keep a level head and just not keep blasting away at this thing unnecessarily, and I'm a really big fan of the idea that if a player character gets a 20 or higher once all the modifiers are put in place, that should, that should grant some sort of additional benefit of more than just being a total success. Now, as I said, gamers that are used to different types of RPGs out there, the ones that you know might have combat rounds or initiative orders, they can find combat scenes really difficult in cult. You know, kind of really challenging because it's kind of like what they're used to, but at the same time, it's not at all like what they're used to. And we certainly had problems with it in our first few games until it finally clicked with me, and then I had to uh, teach my players how to kind of rethink this game. So let me share a few examples with you of how we dealt with some of the more common problems that uh, we dealt with and other ones that I found uh, people have online. First is players that give a detailed step-by-step -step rather than what their whole plan is. Like they're trying to break it out step-by-step -step per round. And this is a holdover from games where there's a set number of actions that can be performed in a single combat round, you know, such as, you know, you get one major major action and two minor actions or something like that, and all those actions are clearly defined as far as what they are. So just, in this round I'm going to grapple this person, the next round I'm going to use them as a human shield and start making my escape, because in the previous games that they've played for years, you know, they describe these multiple actions taking multiple turns. So when a player is there describing what it is that they want to do, uh, Game Masters, don't be afraid to ask them what their full plan is, like what is this entire move that you're doing, because many times you condense all those into a single role, giving it much more of a natural flow than being broken up into these little, you know, three or five second frames of, you know, the player gets to do this one little thing and then we're on to the next character. 
Next is falling into repetition. And this is when the players and the game master might be overusing the same moves over and over again, just kind of falling into a habit of, uh, they hit you with this weapon, therefore it does this much damage, or they're trying to do it in a way that, that mimics the span of a combat round or something that you know everyone is gonna be going in the same order, such as we do you, then we do you, then we do you, but we're not kind of mixing it up with the natural flow. So with action orders, again, look at the narrative and the fiction of the group and the story that's going on. Visualize the scene as far as what everyone is doing and what they have done on their previous turns and kind of determine who should go next. So we might be flipping up order quite a bit. Fights are chaotic affairs and rarely are we going to have this repeating pattern of uh, when people act just in the same order over and over again. So try to give it that natural flow like a fight would have. Now as far as moves and not repeating the same ones, try to define what the roles mean differently every time uh, you have them in a combat scene, there's a lot of different ways that we can define them. Such as, let's say your character is fighting a cultist at the top of a huge stairway, and you attack them with your axe, but roll a 12, a success with complications. Now, that could mean that the bad guy, you know, kind of jumps back or to the side and only receives one harm instead of the two harm that that axe normally inflicts. Or maybe we bury the axe directly in their head, killing them, but then the cultist falls back, tumbling down the steps, and the bloody axe handle that we're holding slips out of our grasp and goes down with them, so now we've lost our axe. And maybe we can run down the stairs later on and pick it up, or maybe the embedded axe head that you know, snapped off inside the cultist's skull and you know, they went tumbling back down, so now we can run back down and pick up the broken axe handle and use that as an improvised club. Or we could choose a counterattack, potentially injuring our player character. But instead of saying that the cultist you know, hits our character with their little cultist knife because that's the only counterattack that they have, we could instead say that you know, when our player character attacked the cultist with the axe, the cultist reached up and caught the axe, and then we wrestled over it. And then together, both of us tumbled down those stairs and kind of locked in this kind of fight over this axe. So our character, now they have to roll and endure injury for one or two harm to see you know, how bad they hurt themselves in this fall. You know, maybe they landed on their own axe blade at the end. Meanwhile, the cultists, they're going to receive their two harm from our attack. But that doesn't mean that the axe that we used to attack them is what dealt the damage. It just meant that we attacked them with an axe and they took two damage. So it could have been, you know, they got one harm from the fall and one harm from our axe. Or maybe they got both harms from the axe and they fell down. Whatever it is. Essentially, the amount of damage is the same, but we're really kind of changing up and redefining what inflicted that damage. So there are a lot of different ways that we can interpret a partial success and what that could mean. And if we consider the list of suggested options and, you know, you can choose the one that seemed the most exciting for the narrative at hand, we can interpret those in you know, different ways and not get stuck in the repetition pattern of doing the same thing just over and over again and kind of following falling into that lock like we might be playing like an old D&D game. It's like I hit him with my longsword for damage. Next. No, we want to make each one kind of seem exciting and fun and unique because player characters shouldn't have to roll constantly back and forth. You know, cult is trying to be narrative based where one roll can represent quite a lot. So we want to make sure that every time we do it, something different and something exciting happens. Another complaint that we've seen is players that believe that cult's lack of crunch means that they really don't have any options of what they can do, or ways that they can strategize and using the rules to their advantage in order to kind of give themselves some sort of edge in order to overcome or avoid a particularly difficult combat. However, that is exactly what observe a situation and read a person are there to do. So a player character, they should always be able to take a moment to stop and look around and see what's going on around them. And the information that they glean can give them that necessary edge that they need in order to defeat an opponent in combat or get away from a particularly nasty opponent. And that is long before we get to all the different violence-related special abilities, and those things can seriously even up the playing field. One resource that I recommend checking out is the free monthly cult drop, especially cult drop 4, which went over some different tips on combat encounters. I stuck a link up below because that thing is definitely worth the read, and once again, it's cheap as free. Okay, well this video has gone on long enough, and I think we've covered the bulk of combat encounters pretty well. Maybe a little bit too well, as I'm sure it looks a lot more complicated than it really is. But we've been able to have some really intense combat scenes with uh, three different players around the table, as well as myself, but it only 
only involving, you know, three or five dice rolls total. And that has been fantastic. And it's really honed my skills as a game master in describing or interpreting action scenes. And I've been able to carry that over into other games that once I started playing Cult, because it kind of really kind of changed up how I viewed how combat scenes and different things should work. That way, it's always going to be exciting and always fun. And Cult was a really good tool to teach me how to do that and improve as a game master. In the next video in the series, we're going to be descending into madness as we cover character stability. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews, how to's, or even more of this series on Cult Divinity Lost, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, my imprisoned and sleeping gods, you have a great day. You know, the very best weapon that a player character could have is not the shotgun, it's not the Uzi, it's the freaking crowbar. If something needs bashing, you bash it. If something needs stabbing, you stab it. If something needs opening, you open that bitch right the hell up. They are totally silent and they never run out of ammo. And best yet, let's say a cop opens up the trunk of your car and they see a freaking crowbar in there, providing that you wipe the blood and the brains off of the thing, ain't nobody gonna think nothing about it. Every group should have at least two crowbars on them.